And the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion number 1734 in the name of Graham Day on Species Champions Initiative relaunch. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible and I call on Graham Day to open the debate. Mr Day. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I first of all thank members from across the chamber, indeed from all five parties, for supporting this motion celebrating the relaunch of Scottish Environment Link Species Champion Initiative. Can I also welcome Eleanor Harris and Daphne Blastari from Scottish Environment Link to the Visitors Gallery. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to advise the chamber that there are now 57 of us who have taken on the role of species champions, participating in the programme that asks MSPs to lend political support to the protection of Scotland's threatened wildlife, working alongside 15 different organisations through Scottish Environment Link. Now, that figure falls some way short of that achieved in the last Parliament when the initiative was launched. But given we are just six months into the current Parliament and retirals robbed us of such stalwarts as Rob Gibson, Jamie McGregor and Mary Scanlon, I think it's fair to say we are well on course to better the total of 76 species champions previously. And that's important because given the scale of the challenge we faced in protecting threatened species and our wider biodiversity, it's incumbent on all of us, not just those of us who, like myself, serve in the Environment Committee, to provide leadership in this area. And I would extend an invitation to colleagues who have not yet signed up to come along to the introduction event I'm hosting here on Thursday lunchtime and make the commitment because Scottish Environment Link are hoping to have over 100 champions in this parliament, and I offer fair warning to the remaining 72 members, they are persistent. Presiding officer, it's good to see once again the MSPs from urban as well as rural areas participating, because nature, as with the threats to its variety, isn't restricted to the countryside. Whilst we do, of course, have some wonderful countryside, both within my constituency and wider Scotland, there is wildlife and natural environment in our towns and cities as well. And it's been great seeing MSPs diving right into their new roles, with Marie Todd doing that quite literally, trying out Scotland's new snorkel trail with the Scottish Wildlife Trust in order to learn more about flame shells. I know also that Ruth Maguire and Angus MacDonald have gotten up close and personal with their species, but I do have to say gently to Tavish Scott, the orca champion, that being filmed holding a toy replica, even at the waterside, really does not count. <laughs> I became the species champion myself for the Woolly Willow in 2013, and this role has taken me to the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, Corrie Fee in Glendall in my constituency, and the Ben Laws Nature Reserve, to learn more about the challenges that have to be overcome if we're to restore the damage done to it by overgrazing and climate change. Those visits helped inform a newsletter I sent all around the primary schools in my area, which I hoped would prompt or at least help inform nature projects taking place there. And just to prove that I was listening when I was out and about, let me tell you a wee bit about the woolly willow, which is a low shrub with uh, woolly grey-green leaves, now restricted to ungrazed areas at high altitude. In all non-arid mountain systems, montane scrub, consisting of species like the woolly willow, is an important habitat above the tree line. Montane scrub supports a range of unusual plants and invertebrates, and is an important foraging area for birds and mammals. In Scotland, this habitat is now virtually absent due to historic grazing by red deer and sheep. Woolly willow formerly occurred in the scrub zone at the upper limit of forest on those mountains with the richest soil. However, it has more recently become largely restricted to cliffs, with mountain hares now getting in on the grazing act thanks to reduced snow lines, courtesy of climate change. Nearly all its present localities are in the central highlands. Only four of its 13 remaining populations have more than 100 plants. The total estimated all across Scotland is around 1,800 plants. That's why it's on the endangered list, along with so many other species, and why Environment Link need MSPs to help raise awareness of the situation. The State of Nature Report Scotland, which was published in September, and detailed work from a number of environmental organisations revealed that in Scotland, despite undisputed progress being made, in a majority of areas covered by the biodiversity route map to 2020, over half, half of the plant and bird species are declining. So a great deal more requiring to be done, presiding officer, by all of us, not least of all we species champion. And, and with your agreement, I'll conclude there, because whilst in the normal course of events during a member's debate, I'd happily take up my allocated time. In this instance, I think my role is more that of a scene setter than being centre stage. 
And I know there are a considerable number of colleagues seeking the opportunity to highlight their allotted species, the challenges these face, and what actions we as MSPs intend taking to make constituents much more aware and mindful of the threats posed of biodiversity. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Day. And uh, can I say you are stealing the words from my script? Yes, indeed, there's a load of members want to speak in the debate. So I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I ask you, Mr Day, to move a motion without notice? Moved, Presiding Officer. Uh, do members agree to extend the debate this evening? Yeah. Oh, good. OK. And I hope... Uh, that members will all stick to, to three minutes each because it's the only way that we'll manage to get all the species mentioned and everyone into the debate. So I first of all call on Bruce Crawford to be followed... Uh, I'm going so quickly, I'm getting my words mixed up. To be followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start by sincerely thanking and congratulating my friend Graeme Day on securing this debate this evening. The number of MSPs who are taking part demonstrates well the pride we're all taking in being species champions. I also want to thank Scottish Environment Link, who have done such a fantastic job in encouraging MSPs to adopt and promote a species. Today, I can proclaim myself to be the proud slow worm champion. <laughs> now, in all truth, since the day I was first elected in 1988, I never imagined in almost 30 years of Sundays I would ever utter such words. But I have a job to do on behalf of the slow worm. And the first thing I want to clear up is the fact that it's not a slow worm at all. Actually, it's not a worm and neither is it a snake, but it's a fantastic reptile. The slow worm, although superficially a snake, is a legless lizard. It can grow up to... <laughs> I'm glad I brought a, t a laugh to the, to the minister in the front there. 40 centimetres long and can live for up to 50 years. Unlike snakes, they can blink. They have a flat, forked tongue. And very cleverly, they can lose their tails if attacked. Slow worms are one of our most threatened species. Whilst they may not be the cutest of animals, they are very striking, with males usually being grey or brown in colour, some with bright blue spots, females bronze or, coloured, or gold coloured, and juveniles having dark flanks and often a stripe down the back. Now, I brought along a picture of a particularly handsome slow worm for you all to see this evening. I think you'll agree with me. It's a particularly enhanced variety. Now, it may surprise some to hear by looking at this picture that the slow worm is somewhat of a Casanova. Yes, it's true. Courtship in a slow worm world can often last as long as 10 hours before copulation occurs. I never in my wildest dreams did I. And I've had some wild dreams, I can tell you thought that I'd be standing in this chamber today talking about the sex life of a reptile. <laughs> <coughs> On a completely unrelated matter, I've no idea why I was chosen to be their champion. But as a gardener, I'm very pleased to, that we have slow worms in, our gar in some of Scotland's gardens, but unfortunately not enough. Known as the gardener's friend, they spend the majority of their time in deep vegetation and in humid underground overgrown areas, rough grass, woodland edges, scrubs, gardens, allotments, railway embankments. Best of all, the lots and lots of slugs and other gardens pests. No wonder they're called the, farmer, the, the gardener's friend. In all seriousness, the work of Scottish Environment Link, and in my case, Frog Life, they are doing a fantastic and invaluable job in promoting species. And that's my three minutes, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Morris Golden to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, it is an honour and a privilege to participate in this debate. I'd like to also recognise the contribution of the Woodlands Trust in this area, as well as uh, Lorna Scott from the RSPB, who uh, Graham missed out when he was uh, uh, mentioning those from Scottish Environment Link uh, as well. Uh, so thanks to, to everyone who's, who's made this debate possible. I'm the species champion for the Aran White Beam. Uh, which, like me, resides in the west of Scotland. It is an endangered endemic tree species, species only found naturally on the Isle of Arran, and it is believed that the Arran whitebeam has been a feature of Arran woodlands since around 4500 BC. 
Uh, however, all the iron white beams are under threat. In 2004, SNH, Scottish Natural Heritage report, stated that there were only 857 iron white beams left on the island. And it is believed that there is only a handful of Catagol uh, white beams growing naturally on Arran, making it one of the rarest trees in the world. The small size of the population leaves it incredibly vulnerable to extin extinction. And the existing tree population is threatened by a number of factors, including grazing by deer and sheep, poor soil, exposure to bad weather and pests. And one way of uh, assisting uh, the species would be to increase surrounding woodland cover in order to enable the white beams to be capable of reproducing, which Bruce and I, Bruce Crawford and I, seem to be on a, a, a bit of a line with respect to that. But currently SNH are working with the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh and the local Duggery estate to protect the trees. In order to ensure the long-term survival of the trees, the botanic gardens are growing saplings in their nurseries and they've recently planted examples of the trees outside the Scottish Parliament. Uh, in Arran itself, enclosures have been established to protect the trees from overgrazing and the conditions of the trees is being regularly monitored. The white beam species are not only very rare, but they represent some of the very few tree species which are unique to Scotland and therefore a hugely important part of our natural heritage. They also provide an invaluable insight into the evolution of trees and species diversification. Their study offers an incredible important contribution to scientific research. Therefore, protection and promotion of these trees is something which I will commit to and believe is enormously important. Thank you. Gail Ross to be followed by Dave Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be the species champion for the red squirrel. The red squirrel is the UK's only native squirrel and numbers have declined rapidly since the introduction of grey squirrels from North America in the 19th century. Greys have replaced the native reds in much of the UK because they compete for food and habitat and transmit the deadly squirrel pox virus. Action to protect the reds from the greys through population control is therefore necessary. Saving Scotland's red squirrels aims to sustain populations of reds across their current red-only range, north of the grey squirrel distribution in the central lowlands and in key areas of South Scotland. Project partners are the Scottish Wildlife Trust, SNH, Forestry Commission Scotland, RSPB Scotland, Scottish Land and Estates, and the Red Squirrel Survival Trust. In my constituency, 40 red squirrels were released at Dundonnell Estate. Some managed to migrate towards Ullipool, and at the end of 2015, they were being seen around the cottages three miles south of Ullipool, but sadly, some were being killed on the roads. In light of this, Bear Scotland were approached to see if any squirrel signs could be erected. Bear said they were considering putting up signs, but there was a consultation process. And this went on for months. So the community decided to take matters into their own hands and put up two signs either side of Lechmelm Gardens. But one of these was on a council road sign and Bear came and took it away. As you can imagine, this upset the locals and especially the children, so they decided to make their own signs, which got great publicity in the press and on social media. And this resulted in the Transport Minister at the time intervening and signs were eventually put up. As a lot of the traffic comes from the Stornoway Ferry, they also approached Calmac, who allowed the kids to come on board, meet the captain and put up signs warning the ferry traffic to drive carefully when they saw them. This has had a, has had a positive effect as we did see more babies this year. But sadly, in the last few weeks, six again have been reported dead on the roads. But there may be more as they often get driven over and destroyed before identified or reported. I have supported appeals to Bayer and Transport Scotland and we are awaiting a meeting with some of the staff to look at putting up a road bridge to see if the squirrels will use this. The hope is that this will minimise fatalities at Lake Melm and can perhaps be tried in other areas on the roads around Ullipal as the squirrel numbers rise. So Bear Transport Scotland and Mr Yousaf, if you're listening, please help us and all the other volunteers that are so, so committed to this project to help us save our squirrels. Thank you. 
David Stewart to be followed by Marie Todd. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I congratulate Graham Day in securing this debate today, which of course has got widespread interest uh, across the Chamber, one of the most interesting debates I think we've had so far. And can I also thank uh, Scotlink for their initiative in developing the species champion model. And alert members will notice I'm wearing my species champion badge. I was never good enough to get a Blue Peter badge, presiding officer, but a species champion badge is much better as far as I'm concerned. And I'd like to talk about the species I champion, which is uh, the great yellow bumblebee, which can be found on the north coast of Scotland and some of our islands. Now, their breeding cycle is relatively short, probably an adaptation to the very brief Highlands and Islands summers, which I can experience firsthand. And they nest underground, often interestingly, in the old burrows of small mammals. These bumblebees are, in fact, the UK's uh, rarest and declined by more than 80% in the last century. Now, this is largely due to the loss of flower-rich meadows and the intensification of farming and grazing practices. So they only really survive in the Highlands and Islands region that I represent, where we have flower-rich macar and traditional crofting practices where they're still maintained. So geographically, they're found uh, in the Western Isles, in Orkney, the Inner Hebrides, and the main mainland population is in Caithness and Sunderland. Um, agricultural intensification has drastically changed their landscape, taking away the three key main requirements for their survival, which are uh, nesting sites, a pollen supply throughout the season, and a suitable place to hibernate during the long winters. And any action to protect them against further depletion, for example, from heavy summer grazing, addition of harmful fertilizers, adoption of monocultures, or abandonment of rotation or macro cropping, uh, is also likely to benefit a range of other insect species. Uh, Thurzo um, was privileged to receive a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund last year to create a fantastic project called Thurzo Gateway to the Great Yellow, which I had the great privilege, presiding officer, of visiting uh, last year. This created the first yellow bumblebee town, which includes education, outreach, and of course, wide-ranging practical measures to help the preservation of this uh, dwindling species. This indeed has been a great boost for local biodiversity, not just for the great yellow, but for the many pollinators in the area who have been struggling due to the reduction in wildflowers, but also the uh, use of pesticides, uh, uh, leonicotinoids, which are known to be destructive to them. Now, many organizations are already taking steps to work uh, together for the great yellow bumblebee. The Bumblebee Conservation Trust has been monitoring the species and working in habit, habitat management and has received uh, funding from Scottish National Heritage and the Heritage Lottery Fund for a dedicated bee conservation officer for Scotland. And the Species Action Framework Programme has also trained up many volunteers who are supporting the species and organisations like RSPB are managing the sites uh, within the bees distribution range to help encourage them. I'm conscious that time is short, presiding officer, and I really say that I think this is an excellent initiative and I would certainly want to encourage many of my members in this side of the chamber who are not species champions to become that over the next session. Thank you. Marie Todd to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. And thank you to, to Scotland and the Marine Conservation Society for introducing me to my species. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk tonight about the amazing flame shell. It's a beautiful scallop-like creature with lots of bright orange tentacles appearing between the two shells. It may look like it belongs in tropical seas, but it lives off the west coast of Scotland and it's a vital component of the marine ecosystem there. What's so special about the flame shell? Very few of us will ever see it in its natural habitat. It lives almost completely hidden on the seabed, inside nests built up from shells and stones and other materials. These flame shell reefs are great hunting grounds for juvenile cod and haddock and offer good attachment for scallops bat. So protecting these flame shell beds helps protect hundreds of other species and supports important nursery and feeding areas for commercial species. Conservation of the flame shell beds and the priority marine features therefore makes commercial as well as ecological sense. Because the flame shells are recognised as such an important habitat forming species, the new MPAs protect them from trawling and dredging. MPAs have been largely welcomed in my community, but we recognise the need to have marine monitoring strategy to make sure the protection is working and to demonstrate the wider benefits. As Graeme said during the October recess, I visited Clachtall in Sutherland 
to try out Scotland's first snorkel trail. The Scottish Wildlife Trust has put together very welcome guidance to help visitors to explore our coastline, which is absolutely bursting with marine life. I didn't manage to see a flame shell, but swimming in crystal clear waters with white sands and turquoise seas was hardly a disappointment. And I did see plenty of crabs and flounders and pollock amongst the sea kelp. Now you all might think that October is not the best time of year for snorkeling in Scotland. I had a good wetsuit, the sun was out, and in autumn, the water is a wee bit warmer. There's a wee bit less melted snow flowing into the seas than earlier in the year. Having grown up on the west coast, on the shores of Loch Broom, where I have to add there is a healthy population of flame shells, it was blatantly obvious that our lives and our livelihoods were inextricably linked to the sea. Good stewardship of this fragile ecosystem is vital for human survival in the Northwest Highlands. So conservation, tourism, fishing and seafood are all critical elements of life, work and culture in the Northwest. And I would invite, invite all of you members to come and see it for yourselves. Alison Johnson to be followed by Ruth McGuire. <coughs> Um, thank you. I'd like to thank and congratulate Graham Day for hosting this important and very popular debate. I'm proud champion of the hair and I'm going to speak almost as quickly as the brown hair runs. It's <laughs> Europe's fastest land mammal in order to make the most of this brief parliamentary opportunity. I'd like to cover what we need to do to ensure that both the brown hair and the mountain hair have a future in Scotland. And I'd also like to thank Scottish Environment Link, Scottish Wildlife Trust, One Kind and the League Against Cruel Sports and constituents and non-constituents who've written to me on this subject. The brown hare is listed as a vulnerable and declining species for which a UK biodiversity action plan has been written. The brown hare needs us to maintain a diverse range of habitats, particularly in intensive agricultural settings, so that they can fully exploit their natural anti-predator strategies of avoiding detection or having a means of escape. And in 2014, experts from Scottish Wildlife Trust and I headed to the wilds of Lothian, just a few miles west of this chamber, and we were much obliged to the hare who appeared and allowed us to, to marvel at, at him or her. Now, these experts that I was with pointed out that simply by letting the edges of the farmers' fields that we were nearby grow wild would do so much to help this species as we're reforming our agricultural subsidy system to better enable farmers to deliver maximum environmental benefits. Presiding officer, the introduction of a national ecological network for Scotland would provide greater connectivity and availability of habitat, food and cover for the brown hare and other species. And such a network would place the same importance on planning for green and blue infrastructure as is done when planning for grey infrastructure at the moment. So, diverse habitats and a national ecological network, please, Cabinet Secretary, and action to end the, barbar the barbaric sport of hair coursing. And now to focus on the mountain hair, confined to Scotland and indigenous to Scotland. Large scale culling of mountain hares is now routine on many upland sporting estates in the belief that it protects red grouse against louping ill virus spread by ticks. And I say belief because there is no scientific evidence to back this up. Constituents and non-constituents alike have raised concerns with me about the culling of mountain hares. One constituent writes, it's most unfortunate for the white hare that it and the red grouse can live together in such harmony in their beautiful natural environment, yet they're so far apart in the financial world. And that the sad truth is, this is a case of the persecution of one species in favour of another. And I support those Scottish conservation bodies who call for a compulsory three-year moratorium on the culling of mountain hares on grouse moors. It seems clear that the call for voluntary restraint by Scottish natural heritage provides inadequate protection for mountain hares. And given the special status of our national parks and their importance for mountain hare, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would consider using her powers to introduce a nature conservation order to prohibit culls and driven hare hunts within these areas. In closing, Presiding Officer, I'd like to invite um, all Members of Parliament to join me at the mass lobby here on the 17th of November, which seeks an end to the culling of mountain hares. Thank you. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll be honest and say that when I first heard about the Species Champion Programme, I asked for a fox. 
Now, I wasn't allowed one, as I'm told they're not an endangered species. They are definitely in danger, though, and that's something I hope we get to highlight at a later date in the Chamber. But today, I'm really grateful to my colleague, Graham Day, for bringing this debate and giving me the opportunity to speak about the species I was very lucky to be given to champion, the hedgehog. Oh. I know. <laughs> this wonderful creature got its name because of its peculiar foraging habits. They root through hedges and other undergrowth in search of their favourite food. Small creatures, insects, worms, centipedes, snails, mice, frogs and snakes. As it moves through the hedge, it emits pig-like grunts, thus the name hedgehog. And it's the diet of a hedgehog that has claimed it the reputation as being the gardener's friend, as it includes so many pests in its diet. Hedgehogs are in dramatic decline, with a quarter of the population lost in the last decade. There's no single reason for the decline in hedgehog numbers. It's likely to be a combination of several factors, which together makes life pretty difficult for them. Environmental changes, the loss of habitat, fragmentation of habitat, fewer hedges, woodlands and wild areas than there used to be. You're more likely to see a hedgehog in an urban garden now than in the countryside. But even there, their habitat is under threat, with very tidy, manicured spaces, decking and monoblock being so popular, and gardens being all fenced in. There are a number of things people can do to encourage hedgehogs into their garden, including leaving areas of the garden wild, perhaps getting a hedgehog home, providing a little bit of food and water, making ponds safe for them, and avoiding using slug pellets and other chemicals. A quick online search will give you full details on these things. The hedgehog is nocturnal, coming out at night and spending the day sleeping in a nest under bushes or in thick shrubs. So if you do see a hedgehog during the day at this time of year, it's likely a young, a young one who has not had enough food yet to hibernate. In this situation, please contact your local wildlife centre who will be able to help and advise. Presiding officer, I would just like to finish by thanking Hesselhead Wildlife Sanctuary in Beath for hosting me to visit their hedgehog hospital and giving me the opportunity to meet some of these amazing wee creatures and learn about what we can all do to help. I hope folk will consider some of the small steps they can take in their own gardens to help hedgehogs, and I look forward to playing my part as their species champion over the coming parliamentary term. Right. Alexander Burnett, followed by Angus MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start by thanking Graham Day for bringing this debate and Link for inviting me to be species champion for the freshwater pearl mussel and follow in the footsteps of a former Conservative MSP, Mary Scanlon. Uh, once again, I must declare an interest, this time in a stretch of a River Dee, where we have carried out work over many years to protect what is one of the most critically endangered mollusks in the world, with half of those remaining being found in the northwest of Scotland and the Cairngorms. Normally, such a debate would allow me to go straight to the good works being done by so many people, but not today. Just this weekend, a pile of 100 freshwater pearl mussels were found dead at Lakinva in the Highlands. As a protected species, this is outrageous and nothing short of conservation vandalism. The law is very clear, so how does this continue to happen? And we in Scotland have an obligation to do all we can to protect the species from extinction. Now, despite their name, freshwater pearl mussels will only very occasionally bear a pearl. And this results in over-exploitation by pearl fishers and has resulted in a mass population decline. And over the past century, they have been lost from over a third of our rivers. So it was therefore great to hear in 2013 the discovery of an unexploited population of half a million mussels in River X. And this will become the benchmark for the rest of Europe. It speaks to the seriousness of a problem that we have to make sure that this river remains nameless to avoid it being targeted by pearl fishers. And it is now vital that as we leave the European Union, we can tailor new protection laws for our mussels. But there is good work too. And just the other week, with Pearls in Peril project, I joined the River D, D River Trust, SNH, and the Cairngorms National Park Authority, along with many volunteers to plant trees at the Invercald Estate. Now, not only does tree planting help flood risk catchment areas, but it also reduces pollution and silt pouring into the river and in turn, a healthier population of mussels. So the situation for freshwater pearl mussels may be dire, but they are not extinct yet. And if this chamber could get together to help prevent poaching and protect their habitat, then we would save this humble mollusk for all our benefit. And as our native species, this is something we must all champion. Thank you. 
Angus Macdonald to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, can I thank Graham Day for bringing this debate to the Chamber and for his work in promoting the Species Champion Initiative in both this and the previous parliamentary sessions. Um, and can I also say how pleased I am to be speaking in support of the Bog Sun Jumper Spider and the Species Champion Initiative as a whole. <laughs> uh, it's just three millimetres long. Uh, the importance of this tiny creature to my constituency cannot be overstated. Uh, so can I thank Bug Life for making me aware of the plight of this little beauty. Uh, the bog sun jumper spider makes its home in, as you may expect, uh, the peat bogs that are a unique part of our natural heritage. So I'm quite proud to say that of the five peat bogs where the spider can be found in Scotland, two of these are in my Falkirk East constituency. So, so in my role as the species champion for the, the spider, I recently had the chance a few weeks ago to visit a newly restored peat bog on the Slamanan Plateau, which will serve as a site for endangered peat bog species, uh, like the bog sun jumper spider, to, la to live and thrive. Uh, sadly, we didn't manage to find any on the day I visited, which might suggest that they're more endangered than we had originally thought. Uh, but hopefully there's a squad of them marching towards the Salmanan Plateau as we speak. Now, it's quite opportune that this debate has been held on the same day as a ministerial statement on unconventional oil and gas, as there were originally concerns that exploitation of coal bed methane in my constituency, particularly on the Letham Moss near Earth, eh, where much of the activity was taking place and where the bog sun jumper spider lives, was going to seriously affect the spider's habitat. So with coal bed methane extraction suspended, thanks to the moratorium on fracking, the little bog sun jumper spider has been given a reprieve and the opportunity to go forth and multiply. <laughs> so, pre Preserving, <laughs> preserving biodiversity through initiatives like the Species Champion Program <laughs> highlights the importance of protections for endangered species of all types, from little spiders to Ruth McGuire's hedgehogs eh, and Gail Rossi's red squirrels found in a broad range of habitats across Scotland. I don't have time to go into the benefits of peatland restoration, President Officer, eh, this evening. However, the issue has been well rehearsed at the Economy, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee and its predecessor, Raki Committee, which had a peatland restoration champion in the former convener, the Moss Boss himself, the well-respected uh, retired MSP, Rob Gibson. In closing, presiding officer, the Species Champion Initiative is a source of positive action, not just for the sponsored species, but for their habitats, for the citizens of Scotland, and even for the broader global community. So if you haven't already done so, sign up to the Species Champion Initiative at the parli parliamentary event on Thursday. Thank you. Can I reassure you, Mr Macdonald, that the clock stopped and restarted again. You did, in fact, speak for longer than one and a half minutes. <laughs> I wondered. Can I go to Johan Lamont to be followed by Jenny Gilruth? Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it's a privilege to be part of this debate. They do say that every day is a school day, and I've learned a great deal more than I probably needed to know about the slow worm. Um, but I think it's, it is an important debate, and I congratulate Graham Day. You might ask... Why would somebody who represents a Glasgow constituency be part of this process? Well, apart from the fact that I'm, of course, the number one fan of the archers, I think, in the Parliament, and know more than anybody needs to know about the agricultural challenges facing our farmers. I also spent my childhood going on holiday to the island of Tyree, understanding the importance, a love of the land and the elements and the way in which humanity, humans and the land and the animals must work together, and our great love of the, um, the bird which I am a champion of, which is the lapwing or peewit. I have to confess that I had a, a bit of a desire to be the champion for the corn creek, and not for the first time Mike Russell beat me to it. Um, but actually, a lot of the issues facing the lapwing are, are, are involve the same kind of challenges and solutions as were done for the corn creek, and the experience of the corn creek should give us optimism that it is possible um, to manage the land in a way that uh, values the, the animals that live upon it. But like everything else, there is an inequality here. We all awed and add the idea of the wee hedgehog, but we weren't awing and eyeing at the slow worm. And I must congratulate Bruce Crawford on championing a species that probably only its mammy would love. But in fact, <laughs> it is important that we love all of the creatures and understand how they all play a part in enriching our world. I am a lot cheaper and more shallow than Bruce Crawford, and I am the champion for the lapwing. But the poor lapwing has a champion who, I'm sad to say, cannot match those of the people in here who have described all the wonderful things they have done as a species champion. 
So he succeeded in educating me and shaming me at the same time. And I promise to do more in future to talk about and um, be a champion on behalf of the lapwing. The lapwings are part of the plover family of wading birds and can be seen in the UK all the year round. They're also known as the peewit, um, in imitation, imitation of its display calls. Its proper name describes its wavering flight. They breed throughout Scotland um, with the highest concentration in the Hebrides and Northern Isles and in lowland agricultural areas of the south and east. In the winter, lapwings will tend to fly in loose bunched flocks and Scottish birds moving to lower grounds and estuaries, some migrating to Ireland and even further to France or Portugal. And despite their migrations, they come back amazingly to the same fields uh, to nest each year. And although they're widespread in Scotland, the number of lapwings declined by 59% between 95 and 2013. And indeed, in 2015, the lapwing was listed as, quote, globally near threatened on the um, IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. So there is plenty to do to highlight the importance of protecting this species. We do need to know how we can work with those who work the land to develop practices that don't threaten these species and to understand there is a role for government in ensuring that the conditions are there, that we do not lose, the, lose these precious um, creatures. We know that farmers, crofters, landowners are very often willing to work with those who want to see these species protected. And I do think this campaign is an important one because it affords the opportunity to talk to all of our young people, to talk across Scotland, urban and rural, about the fact that the things that we do have consequences for the future and that these are things that actually matter. And although we can have an enjoyment can you come to talk about these please, things, it is a very important issue around public awareness. Can I thank again those who have brought the debate and look forward to continuing as a speeches champion for the Lapwing. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to speak today in support of my colleague Graeme Day, MSP's motion on the Species Champion Initiative relaunch. Furthermore, as a member of the Environment Committee, I am only too aware of the importance of raising public awareness of Scotland's threatened wildlife. Presiding Officer, I recently met with the Woodland Trust in my constituency. Across Mid Fife and Glenrothes, the Trust owns two small sites at Largo and a larger site at Formant Hills, just at the back of Glenrothes. In the late 1990s, 80,000 trees were planted at the Formant Hills site with the help of the local community. Primary school pupils from across Glenrothes were involved in creating the drawings of wildlife and plants, which followed the pathway markers around the site. The trees planted are all native species, including oak, ash, birch, cherry, and the tree for which I am the species champion, the rowan. The rowan tree has long been a part of Scottish identity. It is a native tree which grows across the country and has a strong cultural association with folklore in Scotland. Historically, it was believed that planting a rowan tree at the door of a house would protect those inside whilst keeping evil spirits at bay. I remember the croft where my granny was brought up in Muir of Ord and the rowan tree which stood at the foot of the path to the front door. Indeed, there is a rowan tree planted at the passholder's entrance to Parliament, a tree which protects all MSPs, regardless of party political affiliation or even voting intention when it comes to referenda. Members might be familiar with one of Scotland's most famous regimental pieces of music, Lady Nairn's early 19th century piece entitled uh, Rowan Tree. Presiding officer, I am sure you'll be delighted to hear that I will not be regaling the chamber this evening with a rendition. Thank you. <laughs> However, <laughs> I would like to remind members from across the chamber of the former First Minister's recording of the song, which can be viewed on YouTube at any time for fellow MSPs' convenience. <laughs> In 2012, the Scottish Government set a target of 10,000 uh, hectares of new tree planting every year until 2022 of which 4,500 hectares was assigned to be native woodland. This target has yet to be achieved. The rowan is also threatened by overgrazing and there is therefore a need for the government to continue to promote sustainable deer management practices. So, presiding officer, to conclude, the rowan tree is part of Scotland's history. It's a vital part of this government's commitment to tree planting. It brings us luck and it protects us from evil. And I'm proud to be its species champion. Thank you. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Mary Evans. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Graham Day for bringing this debate to the Chamber tonight? And can I congratulate Scottish Environment Link for successfully relaunching the species programme uh, into this fifth session of the Parliament? At one level, uh, it's a great bit of fun, um, but it's also a deeply humbling thought that we're currently living through the sixth great extinction period in the history 
of this planet. And at Holyrood, you know, we think in terms of electoral and budget cycles, and even on occasion we dare to think intergeneration intergenerationally too. But to see that true vision of the garden planet we're trying to regenerate, we need to look further back to previous millennia. So let me turn to the species which I'm championed for, the white-tailed eagle, or sea eagle, as it is sometimes known. A hundred years ago, this species was extinct in Scotland and across the British Isles. Even records going back to the late 1800s showed both sea and golden eagles limited to just a few hundred pairs. But groundbreaking work led by the late Richard Evans examined ancient cultural references to eagles across the British Isles that emerged through place names around 1,500 years ago. He found, for example, in Scots Gaelic, 276 place names referencing eagles and 152 in Old English. Combined with modern ecological knowledge, a picture built up which showed far greater numbers than had been previously imagined, up to 1,400 sea eagle and 1,500 golden eagle pairs across these islands, and not just in the highlands, but as far as the south coast of England, and with large overlapping territories between the two species. Richard Evans' work was critical, not just because it gave us a tantalizing glimpse of the state of nature in previous millennia, but because it mapped out landscapes where habitats may still exist to support reintroduced eagles today. And the reintroduction of the white-tailed eagle has already shown early success, the first pairs being reintroduced from Norway in 1975 to Rum, with the first wild chick fledged on Mull in 1985, further reintroductions across Westeros in the 1990s, and for the first time on the east coast of Fife from 2007. And these programs have thrived because of the support of conservationists, landowners, farmers, the police, as well as many community groups, passionate volunteers, the RSPB, the Forestry Commission, all oiled with lottery and European funding. We now have over 100 breeding pairs in Scotland, with an SNH study earlier this year predicting a doubling of that number in the next 10 years. And the success of such an iconic species now inspires thousands of people, with eagle tourism bringing in around £5 million to the economy of Mull each year. Getting back, presiding officer, to even those late 18th century population levels would be a welcome second step to recovery, but pressures remain. Poisoning and destruction of nest sites still happen in 21st century Scotland, often on or close to driven grouse moors. The game bird shooting sector needs to take a long, hard look in the mirror in the months to come, presiding officer. The petition that is now on its way to the Parliament's Environment Committee highlighted the disgrace of raptor persecution and the need to consider a licensing regime for game bird shooting. There's much work to do to champion this beleaguered species, but we must celebrate success while it's still at the same time keeping an eye on the progress that we need to ensure its continued success. Mary Evans to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate today and again would like to thank Graham Day for relaunching this initiative uh, that I hope eventually all MSPs will sign up to and really by uh, echoing the thanks to Scottish Environment Link to because it is fantastic to see such a good turnout for the debate today and to hear all about the other species that are represented by others in the chamber. And I have to, I have to say that I hold a special place in my heart for the species, the piwa as described by Joanne uh, Lament, uh, because it lies at the heart of my constituency in the Mearns and it was so elegantly written about in Sunset Song by Lewis Grasset Gibbon. So that's a very special species to me. Um, but this campaign is a very important one. There are so many species out there that need that individual focus and that promotion in Parliament and the wider public because we need to protect the natural environments and habitats of the animals, plants and flowers that make up the incredible, diverse and unique environment that we have in Scotland. But holding on to and encouraging some of these species, species does take a lot of work and a lot of focus and probably none more so than the species that I am champion for, which is the hen harrier. Now, some of you may have been exceptionally lucky enough to see one. Uh, if you are, you're in a very privileged and tiny minority. Uh, but I imagine even if you haven't seen one, most of you may have heard of one, and chances are, if you have, it's not been in a, a positive way. The hen harrier is one of the most spectacular birds that we have in Scotland. Considered to be a beautiful and agile hunter, it's often referred to as a sky dancer because of the elegant and acrobatic uh, flight uh, that it has. It's a, a medium-sized raptor and it feeds on small mammals and birds. 
and can be found in upland heather moorland uh, during their breeding season and in winter in lowland farmland. They can be found across the UK, uh, however, over the past couple of decades, they've become an increasingly rare site. Between the last two surveys to determine their numbers in 2004 and 2010, the population of hen harriers was found to have fallen by 22% to 525 pairs. In the northeast of Scotland, in which my constituency sits, there was a peak population of 28 pairs in the 1990s. Uh, in 2014, there was only one. The hen harrier is a red-listed UK bird of conservation concern. So what's caused that significant decline? The predation of eggs and chicks, bad weather and food shortage are factors that contribute to unsuccessful breeding attempts. But one of the biggest threats is that of illegal persecution. The hen harrier is one of the most intensively persecuted raptors in the UK and persecution has persisted even though it's been illegal since 1954. But what can we do now? I think we'll have to do what we can to protect such endangered species that are particular to our country. So that's why I support the RSPB's LIFE project, which is helping to protect hen harriers through satellite tagging, improved monitoring and nest protection. And within our own manifesto, the SNP have committed to accepting the recommendations from the Wildlife Crime Penalties Review Group to introduce tough new maximum penalties for those who commit crimes against wildlife and promise to set up a wildlife crime investigation unit as part of Police Scotland, which hopefully will have an impact. This isn't the easiest species to champion, champion and it won't be easy work, but I do hope that it's one where we will Come start to, to see close, positive please. results. Thank you. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you very much and can I thank Graham Day for bringing this debate. I've been fortunate, I guess, after listening to Bruce Crawford and Angus MacDonald, I would say very fortunate to be a species champion for the curlew for the last three years. Uh, and with the support of RSPB, I have been able to visit sites in the northeast which have a connection with this very emblematic species. Everyone knows the curlew as a bird of loch and shore, uh, and so the loch of Strathbeg in Buchan uh, was an obvious destination. And I would recommend a visit to anyone who has not yet been uh, to see the huge number and variety of birds of which the curlew is only one. Uh, indeed, RSPB recently completed a £60,000 refurbishment of the Loch of Strathbeg Visitor Centre, uh, which will allow them to host many more volunteers each year and also to provide an even better experience for tourists and for wildlife enthusiasts who go there too. Less well known perhaps to city dwellers is that the curlew breeds on high moors and farmland, where it is equally a defining species. I saw that for myself at Corgarf in Strathdon uh, uh, not so long ago, where I also saw the work of the RSPB to protect and encourage breeding curlews and their chicks. And all of this really matters for the future of the species. The curlew, like a number of others we've heard about this evening, is marked red on the Birds of Conservation Concern list, uh, and the International Union for Conservation of Nature uh, classified as near threatened. Britain as a whole is the third most important country uh, in the world for breeding curlew populations with between one in four and one in six of the global population and around half of that is here in Scotland, around 36,000 breeding pairs. That might sound like a large number compared with some of the numbers uh, we have heard but with a, with a, with a bird like this uh, the, the, that is a significant reduction from what we have seen in the past and therefore uh, the, the alerts are, are very well uh, uh, identified. And as with so many other native species, and again we've heard this, um, I think from Alison in relation to, uh, Alison Johnson in relation to the hare as well as from others in relation to other species of birds, it is changes in farming practice which have reduced the rate of uh, breeding success uh, while there's also been an increase in the number of predators which take eggs and chicks in the breeding season. Curly numbers have also been affected not just in the breeding grounds uh, inland and uphill, but also in, in their wintering grounds on or near the coast. But those farmers who have adjusted their farming practices to encourage the curly to breed on the land should themselves be encouraged. And as has been mentioned, this is a time when big decisions are imminent on how we support agriculture in future. And I think this is uh, an area that should be taken very much into, co into consideration. And also in other areas like, for example, new forestry uh, and whether, the, whether new forestry is designed in a way to protect uh, breeding areas uh, in the upland area. So I think there's a, a job of work to be done for the curlew as for other species. And I very much welcome the efforts that have gone into making this debate happen uh, and look forward to that work continuing in the future.
Christine Graham to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Graham Day and are pleased to state this is my second year as being the Species Champion for the House Sparrow or Spug. And I'm doing my bit for them because my garden's bursting with spugs from dawn to dusk. They live in my neighbour's holly tree, which I call Spug Towers. They commute to the many feeding stations I have, living the high life on fat balls, seeds and mealworms. Then they commute to my neighbour's bird bath, have a bit of a dip, then on to my weeping birch for a little bit of a preen, then back to Spug Towers. On occasion, they are confronted by a gang of marauding thrushes, but simply bide their time and then resume their own quarrelsome feeding. When I walk down the garden to refill the feeders, they tweet to all and sundry that food is on the way. This probably alerts the thrushes. They provide Mr. Smokey, my rescue cat, with hours of tormented pleasure as he eyes them up through glass walls with chattering teeth. They remind me, however, of this poem by Norman McCaig called, funnily enough, Sparrow. Quote, he's no artist. His taste in clothes is more dowdy than gaudy. And his nest, that blackbird writing pretty scrolls on the air with the gold nib of his beak, would call it a slum. To stalk solitary on lawns, to sing solitary in midnight trees, to glide solitary over grey Atlantics, not for him. He's rather a punch up in a gutter. He carries what learning he has lightly. It is in fact based only on the usefulness whose result is survival. A proletarian bird, no scholar. But when winter soft shoes in and these other birds, ballet dancers, musicians, architects, die in the snow and freeze to branches, Watch him happily flying on the O levels and A levels of the air. So I say three cheers for the humble spug. He survives. <laughs> Tavish Scott. Thank the you last much, of the uh, open uh, speeches. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, as you well know, I always listen very carefully to the wind-up speeches made by the Cabinet Secretary, and tonight will be no exception, especially as she's going to have to deal with the sex life of the slow worm, as described by uh, uh, Bruce uh, Crawford. I saw the civil service passing down notes. It took 45 minutes for the note to arrive on the front bench around on that subject, so we'll uh, listen carefully to uh, Rosanna Cunningham's uh, detailed um, interpretation of, of that. Um, Graham Day, and I congratulate him on bringing this debate forward, uh, mentioned the fluffy orca can I just say to Graham that uh, if you've ever met a real killer whale, you'd want a fluffy one. Uh, the, there was uh, uh, some of uh, our wild swimmers in Shetland this, uh, this year who were around Lerwick Harbour in August had a very close encounter with a pod of killer whales, a pod of orcas uh, that swam around uh, the Shetland coastline most of this summer. Uh, and, and uh, from what I've heard and how it's been described to me, uh, you wouldn't wish to get too close, particularly when you look just like a seal uh, to a pod of orcas at any, at any time uh, at all. Uh, but there is method in my madness in terms of um, the fluffy orca because uh, I'm running, as Graham Day mentioned as well, um, a school competition with all our primary schools in the islands uh, around uh, naming the orca. Uh, because of the importance of sightings. And that's really the point about uh, much of this work that we do species um, champions. Uh, in terms of the future of the orca, it is the understanding of the patterns of behavior that they have and where, uh, in this case, uh, schools can play a hugely important role in understanding that by uh, providing documentary evidence as to where they are, the directions of travel, uh, and how they're uh, moving. Now, uh, one of my other colleagues had a, a name for the orca as well, um, John Thursday who's now um, the uh, chairman of Visit uh, Scotland, uh, had a problem with uh, wild salmon in a river close to his um, who, were eating, uh, who were being eaten by seals at the head of that uh, river. Uh, so he did what any uh, person would do in those circumstances. He bought a 20-foot inflatable uh, orca and moored it at the head of the uh, river to scare off the seals, which indeed it did. So he thought he'd better give it a name, and he called it, I'm told, My Orca, which... Uh, I suppose makes uh, a lot of sense when uh, you think about it. I'd like to ask, uh, to, to thank rather Sarah Dolman as well of the Whale and Dolphin Conservation uh, for all the help in uh, making this happen and to Hugh Harrop at Shetland Wildlife and to the 5,727 members and rising of Shetland Orca sightings for all the work they have already done, particularly on Facebook and social media. Uh, the posts on these sites have been astronomical this summer. Uh, it does uh, slightly held back by the fact that 
when you're out of and around the coastline of Shetland, there's no Wi-Fi or indeed no uh, 3G. There's not even any G, never mind 3G. Um, so the, the postings take a while. But the reality is that that's where there's huge interest in this fantastic species, in this wonderful mammal. Uh, and I uh, would, in, would absolutely wholeheartedly agree with other colleagues in saying get involved in this programme because the work that can be done in highlighting, yes, to Mark Ruskell, the serious issues around nature conservation and the marine environment, but also the fun for the next generation in any species uh, can best be seen uh, by the humble orca. Uh, that closes the open debate. And uh, can I say to, to the Chamber, I really enjoyed all these speeches sitting here. But I have to tell you that I've been sitting to myself trying to imagine the characteristics that you all share with your particular species. <laughs> So someday I might tell you what I came up with. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, up to seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to congratulate Graham Day for bringing this debate to the Chamber and thank all members for their contributions. It's been good to focus today on the wonderful diversity of species we have in Scotland and to hear the enthusiasm and commitment of those in the Chamber. So I do welcome the relaunch of the Species Champions Initiative by Scottish Environment Link, this was a very successful initiative during the previous parliament. Um, indeed, I understand that it was nominated for several awards and has inspired similar programmes in Wales, Northern Ireland and England, which is yet another example of the forward thinking approach that we have in Scotland. Now, as Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, I'm in the privileged position, I suppose, of being a champion for all of these species. And I don't intend that to be a flippant remark. The challenge of protecting and enhancing Scotland's biodiversity is an important one. And that's why we're fully committed to working with partners to deliver the Scottish biodiversity strategy and the accompanying route map to 2020. Indeed, the route map has work underway or planned for the conservation and management of many individual species, such as wildcats, red squirrels, the great yellow bumblebee, David Stewart will be pleased to hear, and the rare lichens, which prefer Scotland's west coast woodlands. So I'm delighted to see that we have almost 60 species champions already. But as Graham Day pointed out, that does mean the majority of MSPs are not involved. So I would encourage those members who are not currently a species champion to find out about the wonderful and at times fragile species in their constituencies and see what they can do to champion biodiversity. As Joanne Lamont remarked, there's often a temptation to seek out the cute and the cuddly species. But the wonderful thing about nature is its diversity. So I do hope someone will adopt the tadpole shrimp or learn to love the pond mud snail, as Bruce Crawford has clearly learned to love the slow worm. Although with his description of it having a forked tongue and being legless, I did think he'd strayed into a description of some of his parliamentary colleagues. <laughs> Other colleagues... <laughs> Other colleagues were more circumspect with their descriptions, but I think it's fair to say we're all better informed about a number of species than we were at 5 p.m. In fact, we may know about more species than we did at 5 p.m. It's also fair to say that there are species champions with bigger presentational challenges than others, although I do look forward to and could likely sell tickets for the forthcoming attraction Dances with Orcas, starring Tavish Scott, but perhaps only briefly. As some may be aware, at the end of September, Scottish Natural Heritage published a report showing progress across the first full year of activity on the route map. This report shows that almost 80% of the actions listed are on track to achieve or exceed their targets by 2020. But of course, that means that we've also got clear indication of where attention needs to be focused to ensure that progress is made across all the actions. And the importance of this activity is twofold. First, it's important to strive to meet our international obligations. And second, we need to ensure that Scotland's wonderful biodiversity, including all our fascinating species and habitats, are protected and continue to flourish now and for future generations. It is good to focus on individual species. So I'm grateful to Scottish Environment Link for raising awareness and providing the impetus through the Species Champion, uh, Champions Initiative. However, as a number of members have referred to, we need to be mindful that species don't thrive in isolation. Species need habitats in which to live, and there are many interactions and dependencies between species. This aspect of the discussion was highlighted by Ruth Maguire in particular, or as we may now uh, refer to her, um, Mrs. Tiggywinkle. 
We recognise the importance of this wider and more holistic approach which embraces the whole ecosystem. Much of the work underway to deliver against the route map targets is focused at a landscape scale so that the wider ecosystem is restored or enhanced, thus delivering a range of other benefits. And just for Angus Macdonald, our peatland restoration programme is an example. Over 10,000 hectares of peatland have been restored in Scotland since 2012 through the SNH-led Peatland Action Initiative. Not only do these restored peatlands provide habitat and space for individual species to thrive, they sequester carbon, improve water storage and provide benefits for local communities. So I'd urge you all to think of species not just in terms of the individual bird, animal, insect or plant, but to think more broadly about how protecting and enhancing our biodiversity can benefit a wide range of policy outcomes, including for people. Most importantly, healthy species and habitats make for healthy people's health and well-being. And for this reason, I'm delighted to see that the relaunched Species Champions Initiative has a new focus on urban species. An exemplar of how investing in an improved natural environment benefits species and habitats and also improves the health, well-being and economic opportunities of local communities is, of course, the Central Scotland Green Network, uh, which I know many members will be very familiar with. It's Europe's largest green space project and it covers uh, pretty much the whole of the Central Belt. So today's debate has raised awareness of some of our important species and of the Scottish Environment Link Initiative. My closing remarks could hardly do justice to all the members who proudly told us of the various species they now champion, some of which they may not have heard of before they were allocated said species. But I do hope that the debate has prompted us all to take further action to enhance biodiversity right across Scotland. I now close this meeting.